today we are going to talk about something which is uh, uh, which has become an integral part of all our lives over the last several years uh, which is uh, the uh, the e-commerce business uh, so and as you probably know over the last uh, 12 months particularly there has been an added focus on uh, the regulatory aspects of the e-commerce business uh, you know historically e-commerce businesses were primarily governed by the Information Technology Act and therefore uh, a lot of the uh, uh, brick and mortar businesses who were performing similar uh, kinds of activities as the e-commerce businesses felt uh, a little hard done because they felt that they were not getting the, the, the same benefits uh, and there were restrictions on them <coughs> which did not apply to the uh, to the e-commerce businesses. Keeping all of that in mind, the uh, the government has come up with uh, more structured guidelines. Of course, e-commerce is a very broad term, and there are various kinds of e-commerce, starting with uh, you know uh, companies which uh, you know open up uh, a marketplace through which you can buy and sell goods to people who provide you various kinds of services like uh, taxis and food and pharmaceuticals. So apart from the general guidelines with regard to e-commerce, there are also uh, specific uh, industry uh, specific guidelines and uh, rules which therefore become applicable to them. Uh, a lot more thought has been put in over the last uh, six to eight months on how these uh, businesses need to be governed and uh, guided as they move into uh, the more standard way of uh, procuring uh, goods and services in a country like India. Uh, obviously, uh, with an uh, added focus on uh, uh, cashless transactions, uh, e-transactions, there will be more uh, uh, focus on e-commerce in the, in the days and months to come. It is therefore likely that the compliance scenario across the e-commerce business will get a lot more clarity as we move on. Uh, today, I am joined by two of my colleagues, uh, Kanishka and Sarvani, uh, both of whom have uh, been focusing on uh, the compliance of the sector and will uh, take you through the various aspects of e-commerce business and how uh, the, the laws uh, have been uh, uh, panning out in this sector over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. And uh, at this we will try and complete the session in about an hour's time, after which we'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Uh, thank you. Over to Kanishka and Sarvani. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Indranil. And I'll start off with the presentation, and of course, I'll be joined with by my colleague Sarvani later on. Uh, to start off uh, this presentation, we wanted to highlight the um, fact that e-commerce is stealing all the spotlight in India, and um, you know we put in heading as the emergence of e-commerce in India, and uh, to find out the reason why you know e-commerce had an outburst in India, we have uh, we were we were looking into the reasons, and it is an amazing fact that you know over the last two years that e-commerce in a country like India, where um, you know probably n not a lot of people are uh, tech savvy, e-commerce is spreading in leaps and bounds. They are uh, amazingly spreading all throughout India, and it is kind of becoming a regular habit you know, to be involved in an e-commerce activity or having e-commerce impact your life. Um, in fact, research say that almost 27% of the internet users in India are involved in digital buying. So that is uh, huge, that is immense. Um, to understand the factors that help e-commerce in India, of course, there are government initiatives. Um, which has definitely helped. We'll uh, get into more details of how the government has helped, uh, especially the you know uh, the law part of it. Um, of course, internet seepage. This is the second most important thing that has been happening um, in India. A lot of um, you know the telecommunication companies, especially, they have uh, allowed internet uh, you know to be spread widely for you know wider. Uh, usage of internet has been you know in India in the, at least in the last um, you know couple of years you know people are using 3g facilities 4g facilities and everybody's having the option of internet on their phones uh, their tablets their laptops you know it is becoming more and more easy uh, to connect with people through internet in India at least um, elevation of smartphone adoption 
for a smartphone is the uh, probably the biggest thing in India right now. You know, everybody has a smartphone right now. Uh, all possible options, all possible companies are providing smartphones at different prices. So it, it probably five years back the line, uh, back in the line, you know, it was a little more expensive from what it is now. So everybody, you know, every section of the society probably can use a smartphone right now, and it is uh, becoming more and more easy to. Uh, communicate or even to buy things, especially because of these e-commerce applications that are available uh, in the different media. Um, evolution of different payment systems. Of course, India, uh, we have been, you know, more accustomed uh, to the normal payment system when it, uh, um, you know, came into uh, when we spoke about commerce. You know, we we it was mainly cash, you know, exchange of money that we bought or you know purchased or sold out things. But now, you know, there are options like Paytm, there are options like, um, you, know, you know, credit card options, net banking options, so, you know, to purchase uh, things, you know, even if you want to buy a railway ticket or if you want to buy a pair of socks, you can just uh, probably, you know, swipe your card or, you know, use um, your Paytm money or Ola money or, uh, you know, all these wallets that, you, that is uh, coming into uh, places, uh, you can use them and uh, definitely you know, go ahead and purchase whatever you want. And of course, continuous innovation. Uh, this is something that I'm pretty sure that everybody would agree to. Um, you know, over the last few years, there is not, you know, not even a single sector, especially in the e-commerce sector, that has not innovated, that has not brought new features. Right now, you know, to talk about e-commerce or to talk about mobile technology, everything is available. Everything, everything that you need is available online. So that's how you know it is. You know, it is becoming a daily need for every you know all the person, everybody who is probably using the internet that uh, to purchase things to to get services online. So it is becoming more of a habit for people. And uh, of course, the government initiative. The government did have a lot of um, you know a lot to play in uh, you know establishing or you know getting the e-commerce industry to bloom. Um, you know, there were definitely. You know, we did not idly have a lot of uh, rules and regulation which were um, regulating the e-commerce sector. Uh, of course, because it is a new concept. But uh, with the you know emergence of e-commerce, the government also made uh, rules, you know, rules and regulation introduced uh, policies, guidelines to help not only the you know companies who are managing the e-commerce sectors, but also the end consumer which definitely helps the companies as well because if the consumers are satisfied that there is a certain amount of rules and regulation governing these uh, companies it will definitely uh, you know that would definitely attract them towards uh, online products as well so we uh, definitely have been introduced to the FDI uh, policies we will go through uh, the FDI policies in a little bit more detail uh, later on on the slides um, GST. GST is a new concept which is uh, yet to be introduced, but GST is simplifying tax liabilities uh, immensely. Especially this, especially is helping the e-commerce, um, you know, companies a lot because um, e-commerce they do not have a specific uh, boundary to perform to, you know, to go ahead and work. They do not have a specific boundary to. Um, generate or you know work within a specific boundary they can work across the states across cities and especially with you know uh, immense um, you know complexities of the taxes that we had different amount of um, you know taxes that were um, charged in different states it was difficult for the e-commerce companies now with gst it is simplifying a lot we'll talk about uh, that as well uh, later half um, of the presentation and then again um, you know there, another example would be the regulations on fpos uh, of course, food is also available uh, online right now, and there has to be a regulation on how to um, work with the, the FPOs, the food business operators. Um, the government also introduced plans like the Digital India, Startup India, Make in India, Skill India, you know, to um, help the e-commerce businesses, you know, startups. Uh, you know, they have uh, certain benefits that um, you know the, the companies who are the manufacturers in India, the companies that um, are opening up in India in the last uh, couple of years uh, would be able to go ahead and benefit from. So there are a lot of policies that's coming into place uh, which the government is um, bringing in 
and that is definitely helping um, even you know other than e-commerce any sector um, you know, at this point in time. Um, to talk about e-commerce, we want to know what e-commerce means. Of course, we have an idea what e-commerce means. E-commerce is, you know, a, basically a way of buying or selling things online. That's what we know, or through a mobile application. Uh, however, um, we have specific definitions here, you know, provided by um, statutes. Of course, the DIPP, um, the Department of Industry. Uh, policy and promotion, industrial policy and promotion defines e-commerce as e-commerce means buying and selling of goods and services including digital products over digital and electronic network. Yes. And uh, of course they have further um, defined e-commerce entities as well. E-commerce entity would be a company incorporated under the Companies Act 1956 or the Companies Act 2013 or a foreign company covered under the Section 2 of Subsection 42 of the Companies Act 2013 or an office branch or agency as provided in Section uh, 2, 5, uh, Subsection 3 of FEMA 1999 uh, owned or controlled by a person re resident outside India and conducting e-commerce business. So we have a specific definition as far as what e-commerce is or what e-commerce entity would mean um, you know, according to the uh, Department of Industrial Policies and Promotion. Uh, and GST which is uh, of course uh, very uh, soon um, to be introduced you know, as a uh, law also defines e-commerce. It covers e-commerce. It says e-commerce means uh, supply or receipt of goods and services, uh, transferring of funds or data over electronic network, primarily the internet, by using any of the applications that rely on the internet, like but not limited to email, instant messaging, uh, shopping cards, web services, etc. Um, irrespective of the fact whether the payment is conducted online and whether or not the ultimate delivery of goods and services is done by the operator. So that's how GSC is uh, looking at electronic commerce or e-commerce. Now, uh, if you look into the various types of e-commerce, e-commerce businesses, you know, there are different types of e-commerce business available in India today, and they will function differently. And uh, to um, look into the different types of, you know, in terms of functionality, uh, we can we can classify e-commerce into five different types. Uh, first of all, it is business to business, B two B, of course, um, you know, where. Uh, the e-commerce entity would do business with another business is uh, what it means uh, roughly. So this model provides a platform for businesses to find other competitive suppliers. It includes distribution services, procurement services, digital online marketplaces like services, etc. Uh, um, a very good example would be Amazon Business. Uh, probably you know, they uh, do amazing in this B2B uh, type of uh, e-commerce activity. Uh, B2C, of course, this is uh, what we are more familiar with. Uh, you know, every individual probably is uh, a C to this particular B2C model. Uh, this involves direct dealings between businesses and consumers. You know, probably uh, an example would be Titan selling its own product through electronic medium, and you have various websites selling their own products. Probably each and every company is looking or already has established a. Um, e-commerce website and they are going ahead and you know spreading their uh, business through e-commerce medium. Uh, C2C uh, is where consumer to consumer this is um, you know, also available and this is also an interesting um, you know, part of e-commerce. Um, you know, this model will give an example like OLX or Quicker you know, where a consumer or customer would go ahead and probably advertise the e-commerce platform would act as a facilitator and uh, you know you can go and advertise your pro you know, product and uh, probably get it sold uh, by uh, to another consumer so it, the transaction is the transaction happening is between consumers to consumer and the platform is provided by the e-commerce entity uh, consumer to business this is a, a very new concept but it is very interesting as well this is specifically um, Pretty much sure that it is more or less towards the services part of it, uh, because the example that we could find is 
uh, elans or fever, you know, basically where you can go ahead and uh, as a consumer, you can go ahead and market yourself, your skills, you know, if you are probably a, a you know, website designer, if you want to go ahead and uh, show your skills in writing, you can go ahead and advertise yourself and uh, businesses buy your skills, you know, they would go and hire you and uh, you know, that's how the, this activity of e-commerce works. And then you have the B2B2C, which is uh, very common. Uh, there are big names associated with this particular models, uh, who would initially go ahead and uh, get in, you know, have a business to business relationship with the dealers, and then uh, go ahead and sell it to the dealers, uh, you know, sell it to the customers. So they would idly um, go ahead and maintain a, a model where they have an inventory, which um, you know they would go ahead and fill the inventory by buying the products from the manufacturers or um, you know the retailers and probably go ahead and um, you know advertise the products that, that they have um, you know, have in their inventory and uh, going ahead and you know setting up a price to deliver it to the customers to further classify e-commerce we have the different models of e-commerce um, and you know, since we are primarily looking to talk about the inventory based model and the marketplace based uh, model we will uh, get more into uh, these two but uh, we would want to go ahead and slowly into like uh, slightly introduce you uh, to the different other models which are available as well so uh, the inventory based model of e-commerce uh, it is um, you know where the e-commerce entity uh, would own um, inventory of goods you know they would idly go ahead and purchase um, you know they would go ahead and fill up the inventory and sell whatever they had in their inventory um, classic example would be um, like big basket is Zobi probably and uh, marketplace uh, based model of course uh, it is a kind of providing a platform for several dealers or um, you know manufacturers to go ahead and advertise their products and uh, where in the buyers would go ahead and get in touch with the sellers and uh, through the e-commerce platform of course and uh, um, you know the e-commerce platform would be a facilitator in this particular uh, transaction uh, aggregators of course aggregators is a concept which can fall um, you know probably uh, either of the two inventory and marketplace ideally a marketplace aggregator is where a company um, would go ahead and take services from a different company okay. and uh, you know they would go ahead and get into an agreement with a different company and just, you know, provide the end product to the customers under the same branding that the company owns. Like for example um, you know for our cab aggregators probably we can talk about Ola or Uber you know because what what ideally happens in these uh, taxi um, aggregator companies is um, you know they go ahead and get in touch or they go ahead and have uh, personal agreements with several vendors across the cities that they uh, you know work on and uh, uh, provide services under the brand name of Ola so when you're booking a Ola cab you, you probably uh, might go ahead and work uh, you know you are probably taking services from uh, XYZ your transportation service but you are you know for you you're booking an Ola cab so that's how the aggregators work and um, they definitely are you know stealing the show at this point in time uh, bricks and clicks retailers these are companies that would have traditional stores like uh, you know uh, brick and mortar stores as well as uh, they have their presence on the internet uh, we, can, we can talk about a lot of uh, examples so one of them would be uh, the traditional pizza huts or the dominoes that uh, function brilliantly pure play uh, pure play is a concept which has always been there you know before e-commerce came in uh, it was a concept in uh, commerce as such and the pure play basically deals with uh, companies or many businesses that go ahead and work on a specific product specific you know type of product I would say so out here you know a company you know I, was, I would just give a classic example of pure play uh, in terms of commerce a cafe would uh, you know, certainly be a pure play in the restaurant uh, restaurant business as well. So a pure play uh, probably uh, would be a company that would go ahead and sell one kind of product. There were a lot of uh, companies. That
big, big names actually, uh, who started off as pure play, but then of course they have gone ahead and expanded um, their uh, way and uh, integration, they work as well. Uh, so, of course, since we are talking about inventory and uh, inventory-based models and uh, marketplace-based model, we have uh, kind of designed a small diagram to get a more explained view of it or you know, to understand it properly. So, this is an inventory-based uh, uh, model of e-commerce. So, for the purpose of this diagram, we have named a company, um, the e-commerce company as e-commerce.com. And there are several brands, as you can see on the left. Um, left side of your screen. So what happens in this particular model is, you know, the several brands take, you know, the inventory, I mean the e-commerce entity, e-commerce.com, they would go ahead and approach the several brands. They would go ahead and buy, buy their products at a, you know, a subsidized rate, or probably a wholesale price, a price that normal consumers do not uh, get the products for. And they would go ahead and store it in their inventory. After which, you know, you know, they have definitely they have an internet portal, the online portal, which is e-commerce.com. The consumers, you know, they go ahead and based on the products that they have, they put a price on those items and they go ahead and advertise on the e-commerce portal. Now the consumers are attracted definitely, you know, in most cases, the prices that um, you know they would go ahead and offer are less than. Uh, probably what you would go ahead and get you know, the same brand, the same articles in the market. So consumers are attracted, they get dependent on uh, these portals and they go ahead and buy those products at a much more discounted price. So this is how the inventory um, you know, based uh, model of e-commerce work ideally. And we'll, we'll come back to this when we discuss FDI policies and how you know, these have been taken into consideration. And this is, of course, the marketplace, um, you know, based model. It, it is, you know, to give a classic example, it's like a shopping mall. I mean, they would act as a shopping mall, a place, a portal to go ahead and advertise your product, your brand. And, uh, you know, the consumer go ahead and buys, buys directly from the brand. So if you see e-commerce online portal out here is advertising all the four brands and, uh, you know, the consumer chooses brand B. So, um, you know, that's how uh, they, the consumer and the brand B is, uh, you know, getting connected through this online portal and, uh, you know, what is happening is e-commerce.com is just facilitating um, the transaction, but it doesn't have any effect or impact on the pricing or on the product itself. Now, if you go to FDI policies, this is interesting because FDI policies have been introduced by the government recently and, uh, you know, Specifically, um, you know, FDI has dealt with e-commerce and the models of e-commerce. So when we want to go ahead and differentiate the inventory-based model to the marketplace-based model, if we take um, you know, FDI into, into consideration, it definitely helps us a lot. So the first thing, uh, you know, that we should know is that there is 100% FDI, um, you know, under the automatic route. Okay, uh, that, that basically means that you do not require any government approval. So 100% direct investments on marketplace models of e-commerce. And FDI is not permitted in inventory-based models of e-commerce. Now, let us try and understand why this particular uh, step was taken. So if we go into e-commerce inventory-based uh, model, uh, we would definitely understand that you know the price that the customers are getting. So who are these people fighting with? Who are the competitors of this e-commerce inventory-based model? They are the normal dealers, the normal um, you know brick and mortar retailers who would go ahead and sell their pricing. Uh, if these companies, like the inventory-based um, model companies, get high FDIs, you know they get a lot of money. For them, it would be much easier to go ahead and play around with the price. Normally, a lot of a lot of companies initially when they started off uh, in this model, what they used to do, you know, just to get the customers attracted, they used to, uh, you know, put the price of um, you know items or um, you know the products that they used to sell to to you know down in such a way that you know nobody could go ahead and compete with them. That attracted a lot of attention. That attracted a lot of people into of the you know the e-commerce mode of um, you know purchasing and selling so this of course this is a great thing when you are a consumer but when you are a, another business when you are running a shop probably it might not 
uh, be a great thing because uh, running a small shop who is probably selling mobile phones, you cannot uh, go ahead and compete with this uh, giants who have FDI backings and you know probably they're going ahead and selling the price um, that you cannot even get from your ma from the manufacturer. So you cannot um, basically compete with them. So that is exactly why that probably that was the major thought process which uh, was uh, you know kept in mind when inventory based models were um, you know rejected from uh, you know getting any FDI. But then again, 100% um, FDI on marketplace models. It makes a lot of sense because uh, you know as a marketplace model, you know smaller traders can also go ahead and display their products uh, through um, you know, e-commerce portals. So definitely there is no problem or there is no impact on the pricing as well uh, in terms of um, you know, uh, marketplace models. So if we look into FDI, you know, of course FDI has uh, definitely um, specified or you know, given directions of what marketplace models can be. Uh, so it says that uh, e-commerce entity will not permit more than 25% of sales affected through its marketplace models from one vendor or, or their one group. So you cannot, it, it cannot have one vendor, you know, selling, um, it, you know, providing its stuff to the customer. So ideally in a, a lot of um, examples, you know, some big names as well, uh, what used to happen is they would have subsidiary companies, subsidiary companies who would go here and, um, you know, uh, maintain the inventory and, um, you know, they would they would be the inventory uh, based um, you know company who would go ahead and produce or who would go ahead and uh, help you know work as an inventory based model but uh, you know they would go ahead and produce you know pr provide the uh, products to or display the products uh, on the e-commerce portal of um, you know the particular company who is running the marketplace model at the very same time um, you know since it's a subsidiary company, it would work as an invent. It would work as an inventory-based model as well. So these, um, you know, to uh, to basically fight these problems or you know these tricks of the trades, uh, tricks of the trade. You know, this particular um, you know uh, policy was uh, in, you know adopted. And then again, uh, of course, uh, in a marketplace model, you have to uh, provide the name, the address, and the details of the sellers. Uh, then you know there are very various um, you know policies that has been uh, provided. Uh, one of the most important uh, policies that has been provided is if you are running a marketplace model under FDI, you cannot own the products that you're selling. So it has to be um, you know through a dealer. It has to be uh, through a different business uh, who is selling or who is advertising the products uh, through your. Uh, you know, portal. That's how you can be a marketplace model. You know, a classic example. Uh, you know that we have always been taking is like a shopping mall. Probably you can be the shopping mall, but you cannot. Um, you know, tweak the prices, or you cannot have. You cannot put in discounts on. Um, you know, a particular shops uh, which is probably selling shoes. So you you cannot decide on that. You can just provide or facilitate a place where people would come and probably go ahead and uh, look for different brands and. Um, you know, by their own purchases. The shoe company can definitely go ahead and produce this, you know, provide discounts and, and uh, you know, attract uh, customers on their own. But as a marketplace model, you cannot go ahead and have an impact on any of the you know, pricings. Single brand, of course, you know, this is something uh, which was also under the FDI policies, you know, very much, uh, you know, detailed description is, um, you know, of the single brand products. Single brand products are getting up to 49% on an automatic rule and approval beyond the 49% in FDI. Um, manufacturer, an Indian manufacturer is permitted to sell its own branded products in any manner, wholesale, retail, including e-commerce or platform as well. This is where the Make in India concept has um, you know, been promoted uh, immensely. Um, and Indian manufacturers are um, you know, given the limelight, you know, they are given the freedom to go ahead and um, you know, fight uh, with or you know, compete with the uh, big shots from the um, you know, probably foreign companies who, who are uh, you know, trying to exploit the e-commerce business. Uh, however, the Indian manufacturers are given that um, you know, amount of liberty to go ahead and uh, you know, flourish their own business as well. 
Uh, Multi-brand retail trading gets 51% but only through approval route, uh, not 100%. And uh, multi-brand retail trading, of course, you know, classic example would be probably uh, a pantaloon or probably a big bazaar where uh, several, you know, brands are found under the same roof. So, you know, it can be uh, definitely, you know, in a brick and mortar form as well. Because uh, multi-brand retail, which is engaged in FDI, is not allowed to, um, you know, form e-commerce. A website as well, or you know, to do business through e-commerce as well, according to the FDI policies. And uh, to take you through, or uh, to you know, through uh, to the rest of the slides and uh, you know the challenges uh, that e-commerce uh, companies face and the new um, you know legislature that is being created, the policies and policy procedures that are um, you know being built, the compliances. I would go ahead and uh, ask Sarvani to go ahead and talk, uh, take you through. So what do you survive? Thank you, Ganeshka. Uh, hello, everyone. From here on, we'll be starting our discussion on the operational challenges, moving ahead with some of the regulatory challenges before we proceed with the industry-specific laws that govern e-commerce activities. Moving ahead, the operational challenges, the first one which you can see is significant dependence on sellers. Now, the point that we are trying to make here is that even though an e-commerce operator is involved in the business, it is actually selling the products of someone else. So whenever the product's quality does not meet the expected standards, it is also the e-commerce or player's goodwill that gets affected. Secondly, there is a lack of robust due diligence mechanism. Now these e-commerce players, when they get into agreements, they are required to institute a know your seller facility. Now in that facility, sometimes they ask for PAN numbers but there is no proper uh, mechanism to know whether the PAN or the PAN details which have been provided, whether it is duplicate or whether it is not the authentic one, there is a lack of uh, mechanism to know whether it is the proper information or not. Moving ahead with the delivery logistics, we see that there is a lot of dependence on logistics service providers. While some of the e-commerce players have their own logistic services, most of them have to depend on companies who offer such services. Now, if there is, let's say, an order is placed and it somehow gets cancelled, that, that enhances the costs involved. The same problem further occurs whenever there is returns and refunds. The platform for owners providing reverse logistics increase the cost of delivery and operational efficiencies for the logistic providers. These are some of the operational challenges which e-commerce business in general they face. Before we proceed with the regulatory challenges and the compliances of the industry specific ones, we would just like to specify the first one is that there are different states in our country having their own set of laws and rules. For example, under the taxation regime itself, uh, while there is a Central Sales Tax Act which governs interstate transactions, there are various state-specific value-added tax regime. Now, while one state will ac have acknowledged the fact and the presence of e-commerce, there are states which have not acknowledged it. So there have been constant issues of double taxation which e-commerce entities have been facing. We'll probably go ahead with it in the later part of our presentation. Uh, the second aspect is uh, the issues related to intellectual property rights that get involved. Now these e-commerce players, since they are advertising or they're putting up the products and services offered by someone else, there is a, there is a huge responsibility to know that whatever they are uploading, whatever contents they are uploading on their platform does not violate the intellectual property rights of someone else. Recently, Snapdeal had to face some consequences in this regard where Century Textiles had uh, alleged that one of their sellers has been using their uh, trademark. Pursuant to which, finally, Snapdeal had to actually uh, uh, like uh, um, take it down from its uh, portal. Then again, it was in the case of Super Cassettes Industries Limited versus MySpace, wherein the Delhi High Court had clarified that under the Information Technology Act, while Section 79 provides some benefits and exemptions 
to the intermediaries from their liabilities. Whenever there is a question of challenge between the intellectual property rights of a seller and the immunity given to an intermediary, it is always the intellectual property rights which will get an upper hand. Now, as we all know that Information Technology Act is the parent act which can be, uh, which can be said that it is the one which is governing all the e-commerce activities. Uh, if we look into the definition of intermediaries provided in the intermediary guidelines, it includes online marketplaces and cyber cafes. So it is a general, uh, it is understood that uh, e-commerce entities will have to adhere to all the compliances which are generally applicable to intermediaries. But what is also important to notice here is that this is a very general provision. It's just like companies act. All the entities, with, irrespective of what kind of one like what line of business they are involved in, if they are a company, if they are a company, they will have to adhere to the compliances under the Companies Act. The same goes for Information Technology Act and the intermediary guidelines. Moving ahead, we will discuss the industry-specific uh, compliances which uh, any commerce player will have to adhere to. We begin with the food business operators. Recently, the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India had issued draft guidelines for e-commerce food business operators on 20th September 2016. Now, under these guidelines, they contemplate that the e-commerce FBOs should uh, obtain compulsory license from the Central Licensing Authority as the activities which they will uh, be indulged in will fall under the category of Schedule 1 governed by the Central Licensing Authority. Now, under these draft guidelines, e-commerce, FBO, uh, like an inclusive list have been provided of the various categories of e-commerce food business operators. The first would be those who merely provide listing services to sellers, manufacturers, restaurants, etc. For example, Zomato. The second category is those sellers, vendors, importers, processors, including food service providers or catering service providers who use a marketplace as a platform where they advertise their products. It's like a marketplace based model. The third is people who provide storage, distribution or operational facilities to such sellers, vendors listed on their marketplace. The fourth category would be people who provide transportation to the sellers or those who provide last mile delivery to the end consumers. Now it is important to note here that while the, except for the category of food business operators who provide just listing services, all the other categories are required to obtain the compulsory license from the Central Licensing Authority. Apart from this, every FBO is required to ensure that all the articles of food satisfy the requirements as prescribed under the Food Safety and Standards Act and the rules and regulations made thereunder at all stages. They are further required to sign an agreement with the seller stating that the sellers are compliant with the standards prescribed under the Act. They should ensure that legible and clear picture is there on the principal display panel of the products and uh, the picture should be an indicative image of the same product. There should not be any uh, scope of, uh, let's say, uh, aggrandizing the product that it is better than what is what it actually is. The FBO must also display the license or registration on their platform. There is mandatory food information like storage conditions, disclaimers that needs to be provided, displayed up front. The food product by the FBO should be liable for sampling at any point of the supply chain. The food business operators are also required to comply with the basic hygiene requirement as prescribed under the Act. Further, e-commerce entities which are providing listing and directory services to the sellers, we would like to reiterate that they may not obtain the license, but e-commerce entities needs to, need to ensure that there is no misleading or false information or incorrect image available on their platform. They have to specify on their platform that the liability in case of any violation of the standards will be upon the sellers or the restaurant on owners or the direct or the vendors of the product. Further, there is, um, the FBOs are required to in constitute a consumer complaint cell wherein they would notify the sellers, manufacturers or importers upon immediately receiving any complaints. 
The consumers are also will be redirected to the consumer call center of the manufacturer. The FPO will cooperate with the sellers, vendors, etc., who are liable to take action based on the complaint. Further, the FBO has been empowered to take the decision of delisting any food product from its, uh, from its portal in case there is any violation of the provisions in the Food uh, FSS Act or the rules and regulations made thereunder. Moving ahead, recently there had been a lot of contemplation and media reports regarding the regulation of e-pharmacy sector. Currently, if you look at the Drugs and Cosmetics Act, there has been no distinction made between the sale of pharmaceutical products in the traditional uh, marketplace or through e-commerce. Pursuant to this, in the 48th, me 48th meeting of the Drugs Consultative Committee, it was decided to take up this matter. However, while this uh, decision was pending, people started believing that probably Drugs and Cosmetics Act actually does not apply to pharmaceutical companies who are involved through, like, who are indulged in the e-commerce sector. However, in order to clarify this, um, the Office of Drugs Controller General released an office order on 30th December clarifying that in spite of the fact that the Drugs and Cosmetics rules does not distinguish between the conventional and over the internet sale or distribution of drugs, the provisions of drugs and cosmetic rules will have to be complied with in both the cases since they could not take the risk of putting the health of an entire nation at stake. Recently, the Insurance Regulator, Regulation and Development Authority has also come up with a draft regulation on web aggregators in the year 2016. While prior to this, there was a 2013 regulation as well, but these are some of the uh, changes that are being uh, proposed. First, there is a compulsory registration requirement to be obtained by the insurance web aggregators. The web aggregators are required to have a minimum paid up capital contribution of about 25 lakhs. Prior to this, it was rupees 10 lakhs. And for limited liability partnerships, the contributions have to be in cash. Now, prior to the, um, as per the principal rules which are currently in force, the FDI was allowed only to the extent of 26%, but the new regulations propose an increase to the extent of 49%. Further, the principal officer is required to submit to the authority at the end of each financial year a certificate confirming that the insurance web aggregator has actually complied with all the compliances which apply to them. The insurance web aggregators is also required to submit to the authority a net worth certificate duly certified by a chartered accountant every year after finalization of the book of accounts. There has been a lot of hue and cry regarding the cap aggregators, whether they come under the category of just the IT department or do they actually fall under the category of motor vehicles, pursuant to which certain uh, rules were rolled out by the government. While the Motor Vehicles Amendment Bill is still pending, certain states have adopted and uh, have come up with their own set of rules governing the gap aggregators. We'll be discussing them. The first one is the Motor Vehicles Amendment Bill 2016, wherein it has been defined what an aggregator is. According to the bill, an aggregator is a digital intermediary or marketplace wherein the services may be used by a passenger to connect with the driver for transportation purposes. The bill requires these aggregators to obtain licenses, licenses under Section 93 as an agent or canister or aggregator to obtain license. And the aggregators are also required to com uh, comply with the requirements under Information Technology Act. Now, Karnataka is one of the states which, have, which has come up with its own Karnataka on-demand transportation technology aggregator rules wherein uh, it has provided that, it has uh, acknowledged the fact that there is this issue of cap aggregators which is putting a lot of uh, uh, confusion in the air regarding whether they are required to obtain licenses as taxi service providers or do they, or are they exempted from it. Now, the Karnataka cap aggregator rules provides that the license is mandatory for such aggregators. It has prescribed certain standards for um, like certain conditions on which the grant or uh, license will be renewed. Uh, some of them are that there should be a minimum fleet of 100 taxis which should be either owned or contracted. 
the cats should be facilitated through GPS or GPRS installed and, con and there should be a control room in place. There is a required vehicle profile for grant of license. Again, these license, <coughs> these vehicles have to be GPS, GPRS installed. They have to be of, they have to display uh, taxi written on them. There are certain requirements. And there is also, in order to check the menace of surge pricing, they have prescribed a limit on the higher charges which can be, uh, of higher charges that can be made. They have also prescribed a procedure or a meter, the kind of meter that needs to be installed in order to keep surge pricing under control. Moving ahead, we would like to discuss that there is a consumer protection bill that is still in the pipeline, which has again taken into consideration the uh, like it has widened the definition of consumer to include even those categories of people who have obtained any product or any service through the online media and there are there is a fair amount of chance that probably this bill will get passed in the winter session of the parliament then there is also e-commerce and real estate sector wherein online real estate portals such as magic bricks and common floor will also fall under the category of real estate agents. They, pursuant to this, they have to obtain registration from the real estate regulatory authority for facilitating any sale or purchase of a registered real estate project. They are required to facilitate the position of all the information and documents as the allottee is entitled to at the time of booking of any plot. They have to ensure that they do not indulge in any unfair trade practices. They have to ensure that they do not facilitate the sale or purchase of any plot, apartment or building in a real estate project which is not registered with the authority. Now the real estate agent, if it fails to obtain registration, he is also subject to a certain amount of penalty. Moving ahead with the last, with the last segment of our presentation which is challenges in the tax region. As we had discussed earlier, that as under the Central Sales Tax Act, the Section 6 imposes a duty on every dealer to pay tax under the CST Act for all interstate sales affected by him. And according to Section 2, dealers who are engaged in the business of buying, selling, supplying or distributing goods, whether directly or indirectly for cash, will also fall under the category of dealers and any agents of them will also be treated as a dealer. Now the problem which occurred because of this mechanism is that uh, while there is CST imposed on interstate transactions, there is also a concept of VAT. We are, we are restricting our observation only to these two uh, set of taxes just to simplify the matter and explain what the problem is. In case of interstate sales, CST is levied in the state from which goods commence or originate their movement. And the states where the e-commerce consignment are delivered there some often alleged that the appropriation has happened in the destination state and demands CST to be paid. Now, when an e-commerce company merely offers their warehouse facility to their sellers, they are treated as agents of dealers and are made to pay CST as well as VAT. Now, VAT authorities had considered, had taken this into consideration and uh, suggested that there are that some of them are stock transfers and therefore CST on such transfers cannot be levied. However, there was a need of clarification required on this aspect. And it is probably to come up or to cure this problem of double taxation that the government has come up with the model GST law, wherein the concept of tax collected at source has been introduced. Now, as per the model GST law, E-commerce operator needs to obtain registration in every such state where he is liable irrespective of the value of supply made by them. A supplier of goods and services supplying through e-commerce operator also needs to obtain registration under section 19 in every such state. Now if you see, it is both the operator as well as the supplier of goods who needs to get registered. Now while the e-commerce operator is required to collect TCS or tax collection at, uh, collected at source from the supplier, he also has to uh, present it to the government within 10 days of the, after the end of each month. And the suppliers are required to claim such credit from the government as well. So there has been a system of check that has been introduced here wherein the government can always compare the amount of tax that was, collect, that was credited by the e-commerce operator and the tax credit that were claimed by the suppliers. 
just in case that there is no disbalance between the two. So the, D, the DCS collected from the operator will be matched with the claims of the supplier and that is how the government has tried to um, cure the issue of this double taxation. Uh, since we do not have a concluding page, I would like to request Mr. Indranil to give a conclusion to our presentation. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Kanishk and Sarvani, for a wonderful summary of the e-commerce laws. Uh, over to you, Mr. Rao, for any questions that the audience might have. 